Hey, welcome back everybody. Jeff Frick here with theCUBE. You know, one of our favorite things to do is go out and visit a lot of the cool innovation companies that are all around us here in Silicon Valley. It's a real blessing to be here. We could do it. And so we're really excited to come here today to Nightscope. They're doing so many interesting things that combine software, hardware, autonomous vehicles, artificial intelligence, security, a lot of the topics that we talk about all the time, sometimes in the general terms, and here it's real. You can feel it, you can touch it. Don't try to knock it over, it weighs too much, but we're excited to be be here, and we've got the founder, he's the chairman and CEO, uh, William Santana Lee of Nightscope. Great to see you, William. Welcome to Nightscope headquarters. Absolutely. Good to have you here. Well, and first off, congratulations on the recently announced funding. That's uh, good thank news. Thank you, thank you. That's our fourth round of funding. So uh, we're using that capital to scale across the country. Uh, we've now holding contracts in about 14 states, um, and the company's uh, now starting to accelerate our growth. So we're okay. pretty excited about that. So not to do the whole history, but kind of where, where have you come from? Kind of when did you start? When did the first one get deployed? And now you're about ready to launch your oh, fourth sure. model. Sure, sure. Um, company started April 13. Uh, when we started, basically, we got the first initial round of comments from all sorts of interesting folks. Uh, Bill, you're out of your mind. Uh, this will never work. Uh, security is not an inv investment thesis. Uh, you'll need $15 million to build the first one. Oh, and by the way, it's too complicated. It's hardware and software. You should pick one. And like most good entrepreneurs, we ignored everyone and just did what we said we were going to go do. Uh, so we deployed uh, in the real world, let's see, May of 15 uh, was the first one that uh, actually was out uh, uh, operating 24-7. Uh, and uh, that seems like so long ago, but uh, also just recently as well. But you really have bitten off a huge chunk of, of, of challenges, right? Because you have the hardware piece, and they're not only hardware like a computer, but it's a vehicle. It goes outside, it's in the weather. You've got the software piece, you've got the sensors piece, you've got the monitoring. So you did, you did bite off quite a, a chunk, and then you're really delivering it as a solution. So you know, you're putting all these things together very much like the first iPhone. Uh, yeah, th probably two comments. One, clients don't care about all that. They just want their problem fixed. Right, right. And so whatever it's going to take to fix that problem, in, the, in their particular case, is, it's crime. Um, and second, I'm an ex-Ford Motor Company executive. I've spent 10 years in Detroit, a little bit fluent in, let's say, large-scale hardware outdoors. And for me, these are a lot easier than building a car. Let's put it that way. <laughs> That's right, no people, no glass, no, uh, no airbags, federal no, science, no, all safety kinds of highway stuff. things. Yep. Okay, but it begs the question, how did you get to the design? Because they're very distinctive, um, you know, they do look like R2D2, some of the, the mid-tier ones, you've got the stationary and this really cool Jeep looking one uh, back here. How did you come up with designs? What were some of your initial thoughts? Well, first of all, we design, we engineer, we build, we deploy, we support, everything's done in-house. Um, so maybe a little background. We have a challenge similar to a law enforcement officer. Uh, a law enforcement officer needs to command respect uh, and authority. Shiny shoes, stand up straight. But you cannot scare grandma, you cannot scare the child, right? right These are not right. military uh, products, so you need to be able to operate within society. So we spent maybe way too much time worrying about every little font, every radius, every surface, color treatments, really? everything else, because part of it is putting that physical presence there to deter negative behavior. But at the same time, it needs to be inviting enough to be accepted by society. So that one, in May of 15, when we first put the uh, one out, we, we were worried, like, we, what's going to happen? Are people right. going to go nuts? Or, or what we didn't expect and ended up happening was a massive amount of robot selfies. Everyone's wanting to take a picture right. with, the, right. with the robot. Um, so may, maybe to put it a different way, if you showed up today and the machines patrolling outside were painted black, uh, with red LEDs glowing with an ominous sound moving 10 times faster than they, we probably wouldn't be sitting here talking, right? So <laughs> exactly. we had to I spend a lot of time. I was scared by the white one when I pulled in this, <laughs> earlier this afternoon, like, so, oh. Yeah, but we, we need to provide, again, that <laughs> right? physical presence and deterrence, but it needs to be accepted by society. The next thing I think is really interesting is the business model. And I'm sure when you talk to your investors after they told you you were crazy for doing hardware <laughs> and software integrated system and manufacturing, they probably said, you know, what's the business model? How are you going to support these things? How expensive are they going to be for a capital investment point of view? How about maintenance and ongoing upgrades? But you've said, forget that. We're going to go as a service. So 
I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about that decision and how that's impacted your customer relationships. So uh, we offer our technology and a machine as a service business model. So that gives you uh, the machine, the data transfer, data storage, the analysis, uh, user interface, um, all the hardware, software upgrades, all the maintenance, service, everything, one throat to choke, we're responsible. So one of the things we want to do for our clients is we don't want you setting up the robot, robot maintenance service division, right? We need, they're already busy. They got plenty on their plate, all the right, chief security right. officers and their staffs. Um, so we need to be able to empower them and not add more workload to them. So from a service standpoint, that, that works well. Two, we're at the bleeding cutting edge of technology. Um, if we were to offer it on a, a purchase uh, type of arrangement, uh, let's just say I spent a lot of time in Detroit. We could barely cover a cost of capital selling hardware. Um, and that's probably not a good business model to go after long term. So if we can provide a lot more value to the client and then us retain the authority over the asset and be able to upgrade it and as most technology around here in Silicon Valley, it's better and better and better and right. better. Um, as Mercedes mentioned, we drop new software every uh, two weeks, uh, new hardware every three, six, nine months. Um, so the clients continue to get uh, improved technology. And then from a security standpoint, we want to make sure, given the nature of the product, that uh, all the assets are under our control. Right. It's interesting too, I think that I think something that's not spoken about enough is when you have a services relationship with your client, and I assume it's a monthly or a quarterly or whatever, you structure your payment system, it forces you to maintain a great relationship. It forces you to continue to deliver value when they are, you know, writing that check oh, the, once a month or once the, a quarter. The feedback Very loop is, right? is the feedback loop is really important. Um, so we signed one to three year long contracts. Um, we had quarterly business reviews with our clients, and we get to learn real time, and we get real time input. So yeah, after the transaction, the the contract sign, that's when the work begins, right, not right. when we get to celebrate. Uh, we get to celebrate when our clients win. Right. So don't tell me any secret sauce that you can't tell me, but I'm just curious as to where some of the real significant challenges are that people maybe don't appreciate. Is it the integration of these various sensors? Is it the way that it moves? I mean, what are some of the real things that make a Nightscope autonomous security robot special? So as an ex-auto executive, I think self-driving technology is going to turn the world completely upside down. And I'm really excited to see all the massive amount of R&D efforts uh, small, medium, large, and extra large that have been going on. However, we're the only company in the world that's actually scaling autonomous technology in the real world with real clients uh, doing real work. Um, it's easy to go build prototypes, but you want machines running 24-7 in the rain with cats, dogs, people, cars, trucks, goats, and sheep, and I don't know what else we've seen. Right. That's a whole other level of engineering. And fortunately, we've been able to operate in that manner for a very long time. Uh, depending on who you believe, uh, autonomous or self-driving vehicles require a failover, a human one, meaning uh, 30 to 70 percent of the times the algorithms fail, someone needs to take over. Uh, despite what some people think, there there's nobody in there, right? And so we got to sure? be <laughs> we got to be right 100 percent of the time, right? Right. Um, and 24/7, and you got to do a, a good enough job that a client's going to pay you for it, right? Um, and that requires a different level of scale and a different level of discipline. Another question in terms of, of customer adoption. Um, well, for, well, to back up what you just said, I mean, that's part of the benefit of your services model, right? Is that you're getting feedback, you get these things in, in the field, like you said, as, as you've shipped them to heat and snow and this and that, you know, you're learning all the time. So you actually benefit yep. from that relationship too, as opposed to just selling them something. Right. But I'm curious from the customer adoption point of view, what was the biggest hurdle um, that people just didn't, either didn't buy it, didn't expect it. I got great security guards before Mercedes told me that they'd turn over 300% <laughs> a year. But, you know, clearly it's a new technology. It's something new, it's something different. I would imagine there was all kind of interesting um, kind of challenges to overcome. One is just a fundamental structure of our country. Most people don't realize that uh, maybe different than the Department of Defense. Uh, DOD has a $600 billion budget. There is one person in charge. There's a massive uh, industrial complex to build your new favorite submarine jet fighter or, or what have you, and they give the troops every level of capability you might ever imagine, and I'm fine with that. Uh, what I have a problem with is we have two million law enforcement professionals and security guards that get up every morning on our own soil and willing to take a bullet for you and your family, and the level of technology that we provide to them as a country is certainly beneath the dignity of this nation. And so what I expect to happen is for us to give them the right 
set of tools for them to do their jobs much more effectively. The Department of Justice and Homeland Security have no federal jurisdiction over the 19,000 law enforcement agencies and 8,000 private security firms. So there's literally no one in charge and there's basically been no innovation in this space. So when you ask me how are you going to get this into a client's uh, hands, well, we basically took the thing that was on the movie screen and is now operating autonomously on your premises. Right? And that takes a little bit of uh, uh, gall to do that, right? Um, probably the best way is show and tell. Um, you can do as many video conferences and calls and what have you, but us bringing a machine to their premises and instead of having um, a discussion with just the chief security officer or the director of physical security or whatever, it's like, hey, the robot's here. And 50 people come streaming downstairs and it's, purchasing, it's legal, it's finance, it's the CFO, it's everybody who has a stake somehow of this new massive device patrolling their right. campus. Um, so you get that buy-in that way. And then now that we've got a track record of crime fighting, it becomes a little bit easier. Um, so we've had, in some cases, uh, criminal incidents where a client is experiencing one to two uh, vehicle thefts, assault, battery, you name it. Uh, on their premises, we put the machine there, and for the last year, it's all gone down to zero, um, as was uh, Mercedes had mentioned earlier, and that makes a big impact. Now, when the staff says, um, or the guards, this area is so crime-ridden, I won't even patrol. Now, this machine's come here and actually made the environment that much safer. They're going to renew that contract, right. right? And so the adoption starts getting stronger just from our own wins. And so we've now been in service and long enough. They're starting to get renewals, and the renewals are based on merit. You, we had you know, five break-ins uh, or uh, uh, negative things happen uh, a month. Now it's gone down to two to one to zero. That makes a huge difference, and it's extremely cost-effective. Right. Now, what happens, I just want to follow up, so say it is a really rough neighborhood, yep. and, you're, and your machine is patrolling in the parking lot. Um, certainly some bad guys must come up and hit it with a baseball bat or something. I mean, there's got to be a, a tough kind of initial reaction in some of these rough neighborhoods. I mean, how do they respond? So you want to think of this as uh, two different things. One, these are tools for the guards to use. Um, so majority of our clients are looking at this as adding additional capability, a force multiplier, uh, to give really smart eyes and ears for the security guards to cover more ground uh, and be able to do their jobs again more, much more effectively. Uh, in some cases, uh, just the physical presence deters a lot of the behavior. Right. Um, so simply, if I put a marked law enforcement vehicle in front of your home or your office, right. criminal behavior changes, right? right. Most of these right. guys, and they're mostly guys, are literally just trying to get away with something and looking for the path of least, least resistance, right? Least resistance, right. Right? right? You walk up like you, you did today, you pull into a parking lot. I have no idea what this thing does. I don't know what it's recording. I, I like I'll go to mess the next around. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. And that's exactly what happens. Right. right. Um, and so clients get to see that that there's a, a net positive brand enhancing effect. So manufacturing plant A puts one in Kentucky and is like, hey, this this is kind of working. Let me call my sister plant in Mississippi. Right. And let's put one there. Um, you know, Mall A. Uh, in San Jose decides, you know, this is actually working really well. The, these guys have helped us a lot. In one case, um, for a different client, we were able to have uh, assist a law enforcement agency in issuing a, an arrest warrant for a sexual predator, right? That's a huge win for us to be able to do that. Or um, there was a um, uh, someone that showed up with a shotgun to, to basically steal someone's car. We captured all the video and everything else that nothing above 12 stories looking at the top of your head is right. going to be very helpful in doing. Gave the evidence to law enforcement, and the guy was caught before he uh, crossed the state, the state line. Uh, we helped a security guard apprehend a, a thief in a retail environment. The list goes on and on and on. So you start having those kinds of wins. The, the next mall calls up and says, hey, I heard things went really well here. How can we get a couple over here? Right. And that's, that's where we are now. We're starting to really accelerate the growth of the company. So I would be remiss if I didn't ask the obligatory security question in terms of getting hacked. So hacked? Hacked. Everyone who wants to hack the machine, they hacked. take it home. <laughs> so a little bit about kind of how does the communications work? Uh, do they work autonomously? Do they work in teams? And, you know, clearly someone's going to sit outside with a laptop and uh, on their second trip back to the parking lot and say, I'm going to crack yeah, this code. So, so we, we try to do a few things. Uh, one, because we don't sell these things uh, outright, they're always in our control. 
Um, that just has a basic uh, uh, advantage there. Uh, second, we change it often. So that gives us another advantage. Right. Uh, third, the team's working on uh, hardening a lot of the stuff, making, making sure stuff's encrypted, encrypted and uh, we only transfer a certain amount of data that we really need or don't need uh, type of things. And then we hire white hack uh, white hat hackers right, uh, right. to try to hack the system, and we make the changes accordingly. Right. Um, everything, as you know, is hackable, uh, but we try to do our, our job uh, as best possible um, to make these systems as secure as possible. And so for the not hacker uh, and at the mall deployment, I mean, how should people interact with these things? How do people interact with these things in an environment where it's not necessarily the security guard who's trained and knows exactly what the capabilities are, but just kind of in the wild, whether it be in a, a parking lot or at the mall? I, I think there's a bunch of stuff. First, it's a kid magnet, right? So parents can now explain in the real world why you should probably be studying math and science and, <laughs> yes. and, Which is and a engineering thing. is a really good thing. Um, Second, uh, we're about to release uh, in production a, a concierge feature uh, that allows a two-way dialogue between the human and, and the machine. Um, so, um, you know, the mall's closing in 30 minutes, or where is Macy's, or, uh, you know, what jeans are on sale today, that sort of thing. Uh, we can also do that for authentication at a uh, uh, entrance for a manufacturing facility. So let's say there's a K1 stationed at the uh, entrance for a manufacturing plant of transmission parts. 18-wheeler uh, shows up at 3 o'clock in the morning, uh, can press the intercom button, have a two-way dialogue, get authenticated. We have the plates. We've got all the other signatures that we need, uh, digital or otherwise, uh, to allow that, uh, that truck in. Right? So there's all kinds of opportunities, again, to give the guards uh, much more capability. So to go back to the math, you have 2 million guards and officers trying to secure 300 million people across 50 states. I don't care what math you're going to come up with, it doesn't work. And oh, by the way, the population keeps growing, and the tax base can't afford funding this stuff, and you need something that's going to be the game changer, and this is that game changer. Crime has a trillion dollar negative economic impact on the U.S. every single year. It's a hidden tax we all pay in blood, tears, and treasure, and somehow society has found it acceptable that at these levels, it's right. okay. Right, right. And I don't know about you, but I'm sick and tired of waking up every morning, looking on my news feed to find some horrific thing happen again. And what do our political leaders do? We extend our thoughts and prayers. Hey, listen, buddy, no amount of thoughts and prayers is going to fix this problem. I've got a team of very dedicated engineers and patriots here working on trying to actually fix the problem. So we have the honor and privilege to be able to do that every single day here in Silicon Valley. Well, the the, uh, the passion comes through, Bill, and, and clearly it's a very important mission, and congrats on the new funding, and I can't wait to see how you deploy it. I appreciate it. All right. He's Bill. I'm Jeff. We're at Nightscope. Check it out in Mountain View, California. Thanks for watching. We'll catch you next time.